In any case, here I am to talk about agency uh, and share, as I said, what I've learned over uh, the past uh, six years. Actually, I've been working on this for a little longer, but, you know, as a sociologist, I'm very much interested also in the sort of uh, higher order questions of agency versus structure, which is, you know, one of the, the starting point, if you want, of, uh, you know, classic uh, sociology. And then my question um, has been from the start, also when looking at data activism, how can we understand the transformations and grasp the transformations of citizen agency in the age of big data? Now, when I started working on this in 2014, when the project was initially written, we were still talking about big data. Now, big data sounds a little even outdated as we prefer to talk about machine learning, of artificial intelligence, which I have an R uh, in, my, in my classification, just uh, more recent denominations. I mean, of course, they correspond to, to different phenomena, but I cluster them under you know, the transformations of the structure that envelops as the citizens in the age of uh, advanced uh, datification. So, you know, in my talk, I might alternatively speak about big data, machine learning, uh, and uh, AI applications, <clears throat> knowing very well that they're actually different things, but that at the end of the day, it is a, a big transformation into the nature of information that I'm interested on not necessarily the integrating of the process in which this happens, but how does then the citizen um, you know, react to it and how can we make sense of citizen agency in a, a, um, in a situation which is increasingly complex when we look at the role of technology and the role and power of information in society. So this is an article that uh, appeared. I mean, I want to start with just some, you know, uh, some popular uh, recollections of um, the phenomenon I'm, I'm talking about. So this is an article that appeared on Scientific American on 2017. So already like what, four years ago, and that asked, will democracy survive big data and artificial intelligence? Claiming that, and I read, we are in the middle of a technological upheaval that will transform the way society is organized we must make the right decisions now. And this, if this you know, held true in 2017, it's even more true now, after the pandemic, as I'm gonna mention in, uh, in a bit, has changed uh, dramatically the pace of uh, technological innovation and even more so the introduction of technological innovation into society. Fast forward to 2020, this was right before the pandemic. And it's an example that I like to use and, and re revert to frequently. Uh, this is London, uh, where uh, this was January 2020, it became public that the Met Police, which uh, if you're not familiar with London, is basically the London Metropolitan Police, um, announced that they would begin to use live facial recognition cameras in London. Now, if you have ever been to London, you might have noticed that there is already a flurry of what they call CCTV, closed circuit uh, television, for security reasons. So if you ride the tube, but also if you stand at pretty much every corner uh, in the city, uh, you, it's quite likely that you are captured on a camera. So one might say, well, you know, well, it's still a camera. What changes with like facial recognition? Well, uh, a lot changes because we're talking about uh, technology which is in development in a technology that is known still to generate a lot of false positives. Whereas according to the Met Police that survey the citizens of London, about 80% of Londoners would be in favor of implementing this technology in town. Uh, an independent study of the data collected and uh, by facial recognition cameras, so the software that the Met Police is using, actually highlighted that the um, accuracy rate was just 19%. So out of 100 of potential matches, so people that are identified, right, live, so in real time, maybe because they are riding the tube, and their facial features are matched with those of pre-existing data sets, for example, for 
uh, criminal offenders, they might be arrested on the spot, but only 19% out of 100 would actually correspond to real matches. 81 cases would be false positive, but you know very well uh, that this can be a traumatic experience for anyone. Now, live facial recognition technology is particularly scary because it has to do, it's based on probability. So it's not exactly the, the match of, of the face, but it is basically what the software does is to calculate the distances uh, within, you know, for example, the tip of my nose and the side of the corner of my eye or something like that. And, on the, and calculating these distances then retrieve in other faces, you know, the same as exact um, at distance with uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the probability mistake, the false positives that I mentioned. Now, what is particularly uh, problematic as, as the Guardian reported, but it was pretty much all over uh, the place uh, back then, it was already before the pandemic broke loose uh, across also the Western world, we changed the, the debate about these things. We will see in a minute how. Uh, the, um, the problem was that the Met Police autonomously decided to implement this technology without uh, asking citizens. So no citizens, no, for example, local London uh, councils, so or no parliament had been called upon, you know, expressing its opinion about whether this would be a good development or not. So what happens is that you have technology that is introduced in society, intrusive technology. Let's remember the facial recognition technology is like walking around with my open passport placed it on my forehead, right? Giving away a lot of data and actually even more so because they're biometric data. So we're talking here about biometric passports, not just a regular, you know, identity card or something. Then uh, this, this technology is rolled out in society, technology which is still being developed, but rolled out in society without, well, let, let's say outside known mechanisms of democratic accountability and decision-making. So that's something that worries me besides the actual uh, technology. Now, luckily, there's quite some resistance for the implementation of, of life, life facial recognition cameras. And let's, in a minute, I'm going to tell you how. But fast forward to actually last week, this is news from the Vice. Sorry, I forgot to put here the, uh, the, the, the link to the, the news source, but it's from the Vice. Um, which announced, so it was October 18, really yesterday, where uh, that announced that a group of nine schools in the UK are using facial recognition to take pupils' lunch money. So to speed up the process of, right, um, of uh, paying for your sandwich, you could simply opt in for facial recognition. And the subtitle of the article says, this low normalization of facial recognition continues on the name of convenience. You know, it's practical, it's fast, and uh, it, um, uh, it makes our life easier, essentially. By the way, in this article by Vice, in the picture that you see there, you can see uh, pretty much like the functioning uh, of, uh, I mean, the, the points that facial recognition technology typically identifies in, uh, um, in a human face. So on the basis of that, then, of those distances, the probability of the match is calculated. Now, if you've ever been on social media yourself, or someone published your picture of social media, you're quite likely to be in one or more of these data sets that um, are used to identify criminals or identify in general citizens in real time across the world. Regardless of whether you're not, uh, uh, you are or not uh, a criminal, which I'm sure you're not. So we are all already part of these data sets in a way or uh, another. And uh, so the, the question, you know, the, the issue of nothing, the, the typical, if you want, reply or reaction, I have nothing to hide. Uh, might work up to a certain point, especially if you imagine, you know, one day being um, uh, tracked down, uh, simply for a false positive and your life being actually ruined for, because of that. Now, the sad story in this is that, as you might know, as you surely know, uh, given the audience I'm speaking to, um, patient recognition software is trained on pre-existing data sets. But facial recognition software is also created by humans. Therefore, the bias that exists in the data sets, in the training data sets, and into the 
um, the software design itself are, um, you know, basically reproduced then in the function of this technology. If you have not watched it, I invite you to watch Coded Buyers, um, a very creepy, actually, documentary um, of the Algorithmic Justice uh, League that shows, for example, um, how actually discrimination on racial uh, basis, on color, skin color, is really wired in this type of technology. So all of these, as you can imagine, ex, uh, you know, raises big questions when it comes to citizen agency. Who controls this technology, who designs it, but also do we have a say as citizens in the adoption of this? Are we even able to make informed choices when you know, there's very little data and very little studies that are presented to us or if they ever reach us or reach stakeholders? Uh, when decisions are taken about this type of technology. Now, it's not a big surprise that the pandemic has accelerated, and this I hope is gonna be my next project, I just mentioned it here, but the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of a new mode of governance, which we may call governance by data infrastructure, whereby data infrastructure, like for example, facial recognition, uh, technology or thermal cameras, or we are going to see that in a minute. So vaccination passports have been uh, forcefully and quickly uh, introduced into, uh, into society. And this sort of, uh, you know, fast track innovation has, uh, you know, contributed and rightly so to, to offset some of the social and economic costs of the pandemic. But uh, this is also a process of no uh, return. I mean, once, I mean, the, the, the article here said it, Vice said it, this low normalization, right, of technology, of data infrastructure in society has been mm, fast tracked by the pandemic, as it happens typically. And Cologne said it, right, ages ago, writing about emergency, status of the emergency, right? The emergency situations. Uh, justify a number of, um, you know, maybe even draconian decisions or decisions which, you know, normal times, let's say whatever normal times are, uh, are might be subject to, you know, for example, a more attentive democratic scrutiny. It is the case of vaccination passports. Now, I should say that I'm fully vaccinated and very much in favor of that. Don't get me wrong, but I've written against uh, the adoption of uh, vaccination uh, passports. Although I use it as well, like all of us, but I'm worried about the inequality. So two things in particular, the inequality uh, spillovers. So in a world in which uh, um, travel is regulated by nationality, which is already an exclusionary measure, right? And access to, for example, Fortress Europe, as we might call it, is, uh, you know, is off limits for many, uh, for example, let's say African countries, just to name a few, then the vaccination passport adds a a an extra layer of potential discrimination in a world in which, despite the COVAX vaccination scheme to help developing countries to, to acquire uh, vaccines, is only a drop in an enormous ocean. So while I'm all in favor of vaccination passports in a society where, like in the Western world, vaccinations are already available to everyone and vaccination passports are a useful instrument for, um, you know, regulating sociality and making sure maybe that we don't get tomorrow to another uh, lockdown, I fear the potential discrimination on a global scale. On top of that, as someone very much interested in the uh, in the side of, um, I mean, on the, on, on the, at the level of inf interest in infrastructures, uh, of course, I, I worry about, you know, what it, what, what it means to share data and uh, through apps, which uh, you're not, are not super, uh, you know, watertight, let's say, when it comes to data collection. There might be countries like Estonia, of course, that are, are at the forefront of this, but also that have already in place uh, you know, a certain level of infrastructure, certain quality of infrastructure also, for example, for a digital identity. But there are countries like, for example, my own country of origin, Italy, which are really, you know, miles behind you guys. And that, uh, you know, have a huge problem of interoperability between platforms. 
and uh, that, that frankly I don't really trust in terms of uh, you know protecting citizen uh, data in this process. So you know just a little disclaimer about this is of course like uh, the, this refers to um, to some old news in a way. I mean, the, the, but I wanted to put there uh, you know Estonia being one of the first uh, testing it, but also. Uh, you know, the announcement by Ursula uh, von der Leyen from the European Commission of the Digital uh, Green uh, Pass, which, uh, you know, as you know, is a QR code and yes, um, and it's, it's used in funny ways actually across Europe earlier. I mentioned how it is used or actually not used in my own university, but that's another story. So this is where we are at the moment, a situation in which more and more technology for the identification of people and human exchanges is embedded in you know regular dynamics that we used to know as being very different for good and for bad this is actually a very sad story instead where biometric identification implemented as part of the adar identity digital identity scheme in india and it is the biggest digital biometric digital identity system in the world given of course the size of India as a country, right? Um, so this biometric identification has been introduced uh, as um, also in food uh, subsidies schemes. So if you are an impoverished family that uh, you know has troubles putting food on the table to feed the children, uh, you could benefit from uh, food subsidies from the government. In order to do that, you have to give up your fingerprint, among other things. Now, what happened with the touchscreen system that was implemented in India was that it was brought to a halt, complete stop for months in a row at the inception of the pandemic, because in a situation of total confusion, when we, we didn't really know much about you know, the virus diffusion and there were a lot of fears and also a lot of probably fake news in the process, right? But you, you remember those times, right? India decided to stop distributing food subsidies because it couldn't rely on the identification method that was being used, which was the, um, the, this biometric identification. So a lot of people that were already impoverished and in the informal economy before you know, the lockdown, before uh, those type of problems, then uh, before the, the, the pandemic hit, and of course, with the pandemic, then even you know, so vanishing, there are few chances of you know operating in the informal economy, and therefore earning some money. They were left hungry, with the um, consequences that you can imagine. So um, this is also you know something that speaks to agency again, but also again to inequality, which is my other fixation. By the way, this um, this is a blog post written by a colleague of mine, Silvia Mazero, that is contained together with many others in this book, which you don't see very well. COVID-19 from the margins, in this pandemic invisibilities, policies and resistance in the data fight society, which is, if you want, is a bit of an instant book. It's pretty thick. And this is the result of a number of conversations that we had in the blog uh, called COVID-19 from the margins, which was animated by, uh, by my, my group, the Data Active Group, and edited by myself, Sid Masiero, and Emiliano Trere from, uh, from Cardiff University. Now, if you're curious, by the way, it's a, it's a book in five languages, and um, it really tries to take stock of you know, the first pandemic of the data file society, what it means for, among other things, also citizen agency. And it's distributed for free. So if you, I'm going to put the link then on the chat. And if you want, I mean, you can, of course, download a PDF of, of EPUB versions for free from the website, but you can also simply request your printed copy. I have many in my office because, of course, we haven't had any event since. And so I'm waiting for a conference. In the meantime, I have the big piles of boxes, which are a bit scary and risk falling off my, on my head every time. So if you want, if you like me, like you like paper, I'm very happy to ship it uh, to you. I'm going to put it later. I mean, the, the link later in the chat to the form where you can request it. You have to be a bit patient because you're not yet entirely welcome to the office. So I go once a week and then I, I, I do the, 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 the sending and then. But uh, they are there. And amongst the, you know, the story about the biometric social welfare in lockdown in India, there's many other similar stories. 
But so back to our questions, these were all the sort of introductory examples. Uh, I guess I already gave you an idea of where uh, we are at with, uh, you know, the question of agency in um, democracies. When citizens are not only for the most part lacking some notable exception, but lacking the, the skills to understand, uh, you know, the literacy to understand technological development, but they're also subject to massive advertising, pushing for technology adoption. Um, I regularly try to read Italian news, especially given I'm living abroad, and there is uh, an, an obsessive advertising these days of a new contract for, I think, gas and electricity that as a presence gives you a camera that allows you to control from, from, from far away your, your loved ones. So to check whether your kids are stealing, you know, the marmalade for the, for uh, from the from the fridge, but um, you know it's creepy because in a way it's, there's an enormous uh, you know advertising effort to normalize this technology, which have a number of consequences I have. And so altogether we can claim the identification as the process of transforming pretty much any social interaction, but also interpersonal interaction into data and also pretty much any action that we ourselves do as individuals has accelerated the crisis of liberal democracy. Now, why do I take liberal democracy as a sort of horizon, the, the term of comparison, if I want? Well, because liberal democracy in principle is supposed to, and I say supposed to, but um, is supposed to um, uphold constitutionally, um, you know, a, a lot of rights, let's say, I mean, maybe you shouldn't say um, um, human rights because that's not necessarily always the case and there's no, you know, civic rights are not the same as human rights. But uh, in a way, liberal democracy is the one that is the most empowered to uh, protect us. Now, there is also an interesting argument here that uh, by um, Virginia Eubanks, that wonderful book of, of hers, which now, of course, I cannot remember the title of, but that was here around maybe before. In any case, you probably know what book I'm talking about. Yeah, Automating Inequality, this one, which uh, where she claims that if we really want to understand the future of datification, the future of privacy intrusions, we ought to look not at the rich people, you know, the, the users of Apple and the, the, the first to buy the new iPhone, but at the poor, because that's where all the, the most draconian technologies are tested to see whether they can be rolled out in society. And where in a way the, the privacy, for example, and human rights expectation are the lowest. So that's a fair point. And, but in fact, also in liberal democracies, there are several pockets of poverty. In any case, I'm gonna take as a term of reference the, the liberal democratic uh, system. Uh, why um, am I saying that, uh, you know, that, that there's this crisis in liberal democracy? Now, we've been talking, I mean, politologists have been talking about the crisis of liberal democracy for, you know, several, several decades by now, I guess, a couple of decades at, uh, at their minimum. And noting, for example, declining voter turnout, so, you know, this disaffection towards um, the political machine, um, the rise of populism in many in many European countries as well, for example, and uh, you know similar phenomena that seem to signal, in their opinion, that uh, the the social contract between the state and its citizens is somehow uh, strained. And uh, what I fear is that human machine interactions that, that are based in favor of machine decision making put citizen sovereignty at risk. Now, this is the case of facial recognition technology. And in general, of all technology that it's not only intrusive, meaning omnipresent, it's not only a technology for which it's hard, if not impossible to opt out, if you still want to be part of a society, but it's also technology that, uh, you know, operates in the realm, in the realm of machine learning. So it's technology for which little is known about its functioning, except the initial uh, you know, instructions for the most part. Now I'm over generalizing here, but I guess I, I know, uh, you know what I'm talking um, about. So uh, it's difficult 
in the Netherlands, there's been a case recently that probably illustrates this point quite nicely, although it's a very sad story. Uh, so in the Netherlands, uh, the um, public administrations use the algorithms to identify potential cases of fraud into a scheme that was designed to support. So it was a, ch a, child, a child welfare scheme. So if you are uh, you know, an impoverished uh, household, uh, then you would receive some money to support uh, you know, your, your, the, the school trajectory of your children, maybe their sport, maybe you know, their healthcare, uh, whatever. Now, fraud exists, has always existed pretty much anywhere, even in the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, what they decided to do was to roll out this software that would identify, that would help, but you know, those checking that no one abuses of the system uh, in, into the, the, with the identification of potential, uh, you know, misbehavior. Now, as it turned out, the software was biased against people with a foreign surname, people with low income, we're talking about families here, so low income families, and also families living in certain bad neighborhoods. These people were uh, approached, so identified by the software, approached and asked to return large sums of money, all the money that had been corresponding, uh, corresponded to them by the state over years of welfare subsidies. So some families were asked to return 30, 60,000 euros, right? And I mean, these are poor, poor families. And for, you know, maybe one, two cases, I don't know the numbers now, right? But of uh, the, the certainly, you know, the software also helped identifying, uh, you know, those misbehaving. But for the most part, actually, these were false positive. And they were false positive based on the human bias of, you know, against migrants, if you want, right? Second generation uh, Dutch citizens, for example or against yeah, people with foreign surname or uh, low income. So the idea that if you are, for example, a migrant, you are much more likely to commit fraud against the Dutch state. This resulted in a major, major uh, scandal that um, actually led to the resignation shortly before the elections, in fact, but the resignation of the Rutte government in, um, I think, January or February 2021, yeah, earlier this year. But uh, it's still being debated. And the shock that these families had to suffer in the moment in which you, know, you try to seek redress. So you have been accused of fraud. You have not committed fraud. You're trying to seek redress, but it's difficult to seek redress from a software, right? I mean, if uh, there is a local uh, public administration employee that uh, you, know, you can appeal to, maybe they can, you know, First of all, they are a little more human, but they can also look into the paperwork and try to identify what the problem is. We tend to believe software and software decision making much more than we believe humans. So, you know, this is a good example, very sad, but good example of, of the, you know, the, the, the fact that citizen sovereignty and citizen agency gets lost in the process in which we uh, attribute so much power to software. That is biased because we are biased, right? So it's not that maybe the software is more biased than humans, but then there's many other, uh, unfortunately, other um, sides of the story, uh, including the fact that we tend to trust software more than, than people. That makes so that our citizen sovereignty is uh, at risk. Um, interestingly, datification uh, can also ever be a productive force and I like to, to refer to what Kennedy, Ellen Kennedy, Thomas Paul, and a few others wrote in an introduction to um, a special issue, which I, I think it was on data agency. I'm not even sure actually the title of, uh, of, the, of the actual special issue back then. It was 2015, but I encourage you to have a look at it, especially at this introduction, where they say that identification can be seen as a process of feeding such data so data I means they were talking about data. So the data that is collected back to users, enabling them to orient themselves in the world. So in a way, not all is lost. I mean, for the stories that I was talking about, of for example, the Dutch state um, misbehaving using software and attacking migrant families and doing so 
erroneously with you know the, the consequences that this has. There's also another side of the story, which is that in fact, I mean, it's not all bad stories, but it's also the possibility for citizens to appropriate data or use data. And that's you know the entire adventure behind data activism and our work on data activism, trying to see how citizens themselves can then you know, appropriate data, make sense of data and reclaim their agency and you know, get out of a condition of subalternity and uh, uh, you know, be citizens again, if you want, in an increasingly complex environment. So what is the agency I have? I mean, I, I said magical words which are overcharged and for which you know, tons of political science books have been written and sociology books as well over the years. I said agency, I mentioned uh, citizen sovereignty as a liberal democracy, all of this social contract, but how do I define agency then in the context of my story here? And where can we find it and how especially can we foster it if our intention is to find a way to empower citizens into this increasingly complex environment so that we transform what is potentially a disempowerment story into a story of you know, citizens agency, which is reclaimed and enacted. Now I mentioned uh, already um, the, my, my, my sociological origin in a way, or the sociological origin of a lot of my reflections in this regard, and this tension between agency and structure, which I'm sure you're familiar with, so I don't now spend too much time uh, explaining it, but essentially where you have, you know, the agency is us, and what we try to do in the structure is what constrains us but also empowers us to some extent, right? So everything that is around us, uh, talk about, think about social norms, think about public administration institutions, the university where we work and so on and so forth. The family is also part of the structure, for example, or a group of peers. I like to think of agency together with a number of, of scholars that I respect, including Nick Caldry, um, as a process. Um, a process why it's not a static attribute. It's not that because I'm a citizen, I mean, it should be the case, but it's really not the case. Uh, because I am a citizen of some, some country, uh, then I also you know, automatically have some agency. In principle, there is some of it is, is written in the constitution. For example, I have some agency in the moment in which I have the right to vote for my representative in parliament at the local level, and you name it, all the various levels of, um, of the organization of democratic society. So that's, that's, yes, a form of agency. But, uh, you know, agency can also, I'm hungry and I go and open the fridge and take out a yogurt. That is also not exactly what we mean by political agency. But in any case, what I want to highlight is that agency is a process and not a, a static attribute that we own once uh, for all. We can decide to use it or we can decide not to use it, but there's something that changes over time. Nick Aldry says, and there's the, the, you see the, the, the article cited at the bottom of the slide, that agency refer, refers to the act of making sense of the world so as to act within it. So um, here, essentially, we, we refer to, uh, you know, similar to, to what uh, Kennedy and, and others said here, like, you know, the productive force, the part of, uh, of us taking, making sense of an co increasingly complex technological and informational environment, so that to, to be empowered to act within it. But then there is even a, a piece that I think for me has been uh, more enlightening when it comes to, uh, to thinking uh, about uh, agency in a sociological term. So it's an old article uh, from, I think, the American Sociological Review, I'm not even sure, but it's dated 1988 uh, by Emin and Misha, who, um, this is a bit of a long quote, so maybe we don't even need to, uh, to um, uh, go really through it word by word. It's a very complex piece, actually, but they are those that speak about agency as process. And they also talk about agencies being composed, so but being a temporal, having a temporal dimension, so a time dimension as well. So changing over time. So not only is not an attribute, static attribute, but it's also something that might change uh, based on what we do, but it's also the result of the interplay of three factors, they think, what they call habit. So what we know, we have been knowing all the time, imagination, 
our capacity of abstraction and imagining alternatives, but also judgment. So our capacity of making informed decision space, for example, on value. So this is, uh, you know, um, I leave it at that. I invite you, if you're curious, to have uh, a look. It's a very dense piece, and I'm not doing it any justice by just highlighting three red words, but it has influenced dramatically the way, you know, my thinking of agency as process and agencies being made of various elements, including, uh, you know, they say agency has five attributes. It's intentional. It's reflexive, it's informed, it's relational, and it is situated. And I find it interesting that it is relational and situated, meaning that it is very much like it has to do with where we are at the given point, not only uh, you know, in terms of location, but in terms of uh, where we are emotionally and whatever. But it's also relational. It's something that no citizen typically does by themselves, but together with other fellow citizens. But where can we find agency in this human machine interactions? I mean, I made clear that we live in this very complex world inhabited by a number of, uh, you know, for example, decision making that is implemented through human machine interactions where we typically lose ground in favor of the machine. So in this context where, you know, decisions are taken by algorithms, where can we find this agency that is so much long for. Uh, well, this is, uh, you know, this refers again to, to the, the problem of the pandemic. So technology that is rolled out in the absence of public debate, democratic oversight and adequate regulation, which once adopted in times of crisis, its presence is rarely ever questioned. And this is, you know, in a way for me, the pandemic made it even more urgent to carefully think about what we mean by agency and what we want to mean agency to look like in this complex environment, precisely for these uh, reasons. And I like to situate agency because that's what I studied, data activism in what I call bottom-up data practices. This is probably only one of the places where you can find uh, agency, you can identify agency, but it's my favorite for a very simple reason that, you know, I spent so many years um, disentangling what we mean by data activism and what we mean by, you know, appropriation by citizens of, uh, you know, the possibilities offered, the productive force that Kennedy was talking about, offered by uh, big data and artificial intelligence. So data activism, uh, you know, as an instance of bottom-up data practices um, allows us to take a critical approach to data and notification. And by critical approach, I, I mostly refer to the process of asking questions. I don't necessarily mean, uh, you know, the process of uh, running away from something, but the process of interrogating what happens around us in order to, be, to make informed choices. But what transforms data? You know, we see all this data, this technology around us. Uh, what is what triggers the transformation between data? I mean, from data into then activism or enactment of citizen uh, agents agency. I like to use this uh, this example. Um, this is a, a, a campaign that I encourage you to uh, take a close look at also because they are being particularly active these days trying to collect signatures uh, across um, the European continent in order to ask uh, the European Union to ban biometric mass surveillance, you know, the rollout basically of uh, facial recognition technology in particular in public space. So this is called Reclaim Your Face. It's a campaign sponsored by a number of digital rights and human rights organizations, including Amnesty International, you name them. And it's really trying to take the issue of biometric surveillance seriously and making a major effort of translating the, um, you know, the, 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 the possibilities, but also the threats, of course, of this technology for 
uh, regular people. Now, uh, you know, the problem is that we need more and more of this type of processes of translation of the problem into very concrete uh, examples, because otherwise parents are gonna be left completely speechless when they're simply notified, like in the UK, that their kids in school uh, don't need money, really don't need cards, but they're gonna pay with their facial features, right? What I talk about, uh, you know, uh, the difficulty of opting uh, out. And um, yeah, reclaiming your face is a great example of something that actually was launched before the pandemic, I think. Not even sure now, but that is um, particularly active uh, now in trying to uh, to in, in really making sense of this. Uh, so investing in this translation uh, exercise. And uh, you know, I like to. So this is a notion that I came up with a few years ago, but that I didn't really have much time. I mean, I'm now for a book trying to to make sense of it and so take it as it is because I don't have much better. Uh, definition. Uh, like often, you know, people like me were classical uh, education in Italy, that's very frequent. We studied Latin and ancient Greek, and uh, we resort to the etymology of words to, to make sense of reality. And this is, uh, you know, ancient Greek, our oh, Greek actually. Um, I, so the process of transformation um, of data into uh, activism or into the enactment of, of agency um, can be, you know, found in what I call data lodges. And data lodges are, you know, data is data. Lodges refers to logos, the process of knowing. So data lodges are ways of making sense of datification. Now, I don't expect this neologism to be very popular because it's a bit, uh, you know, um, it's a bit uh, theoretical, probably, and the way I'm going to write it down is probably going to even more going to be more theoretical. But it tries really to capture the moment in which there is this translation into, uh, you know, what Nick Coldry wrote earlier, said earlier. What is it? Um, the making sense of the world as so to act within it. So the moment that theology refers to precisely that moment in which we make sense of data and decide what is our position and how to relate to uh, this increasingly complex um, tech or informational environment. Um, what contributes to these data logics? Well, the example of reclaim your face already gives part of the answer. I want to focus on two, to conclude on two uh, elements. On the one hand, uh, the idea of data uh, literacy, meaning, uh, well, it's not an idea, it's a notion, it's something actually Estonia, I believe, is quite good at, but the idea of providing citizens with the necessary skills to understand the, this increasingly complex uh, world that they live in. And the second is also the exercise of critical imagination. Now, I like uh, Alice in Wonderland, so that's the reference here. But it's a bit more than that, of course. And by critical imagination, I refer to the ability to imagine alternatives to the world that we live in, which is exactly what Misha and I mean by and Misha mentioned, with uh, you know habit, imagination, and uh, judgment back in 1988, and certainly not referring to to data yet. So this is um, what I think we need. You know the 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 example of uh, the campaign reclaim your face is quite good in that because it really tries to contribute to data literacy explaining what is certain technology facial recognition in this case uh, what are the, the the problems that it comes with uh, it's this there's, there's a desirability because there's also some of that right we all want to you know go back to normal or go back to the stadium so we are ready to this is this is a real life case huh? We are ready to accept, to be spied at the stadium, simply to go back and with the official excuse being, being COVID prevention. And that's, that happened in Italy, actually, in the, in the stadium of FC uh, Roma, in the city of Rome, in the capital. But, uh, you know, there's also then the, an effort that has to be made, and that's where NGOs, for example, dedicated NGOs, have a big role to play into instilling the critical imagination, showing, for example, that you know, different notification is 
possible. And um, another ways of, uh, of imagining or defining the etiologies has to do with the creation of alternative epistemologies, so alternative ways of making sense of the reality we live in, together with radical practices of engagement, typical, for example, of uh, data activism. And the result is, you know, a, a sort of different visions of datification from the bottom up. I'd like to, uh, you know, point you to something that uh, is one of the last, um, not the last, but one of the most recent uh, outputs of um, uh, of my of my project team, which is an article uh, written together with Becky Kazansky, who is uh, a PhD student, super talented, who is going to defend her PhD by the way in November in December. So watch out for this lady because she's she's pretty awesome. But together we wrote uh, an article which provides some example of what I mean by data logies and all of this and this uh, effort of critical imagination. An article called Bodies Not Templates Contesting Dominant Ima Algorithmic Imaginaries for a New Media and Society, a special issue actually on um, technology related imaginaries, which contain many other even more interesting articles. But the reason why I mention it is that, uh, you know, we try to make sense of um, various types of, um, in the interest of time, I try to, to speed up a little bit, but various types of attempts by civil society to make sense of technology for people out there. Now, this was an early example related to um, facial recognition technology, but as those that, 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 that one that is already present in our laptops, and uh, this experimented, so this, this activist group experimented with the project called CV, uh, CV Dazzle uh, and explores our fashion, but more than fashion, actually, you know, how you wear your hair, but especially like um, makeup, very intrusive, very colorful makeup, how it can be used as a camouflage to confuse the software, you know, the facial recognition software. Now, uh, to be very fair, this type of camouflage would not work with more advanced forms of detection of facial, of biometrical features, like the one in London, just to be very clear. That's why I said this is, a, this is an early example. Nor, of course, can we go around painted in, 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 in red and blue and yellow the entire day just to prevent, you know, facial recognition technology in our neighbor to detect us. But I think this is a good example in that it really tries also with a sort of playful approach to bridge the gap between uh, what is, uh, you know, the history, like the, the presentation of technology by marketeers and technology developers and the, the risks as they are perceived by the population, in particular by human rights defenders and other type of activists. And, uh, you know, tries to do so uh, in a way that allows people to familiarize with the technology and also then try to create a collective response. One that, as I said, is not very practical and is more like an artistic intervention, but an artistic intervention that, that allows for, uh, you know, the data literacy that I was talking about to emerge. Uh, this is another example, uh, dina.org. It's uh, actually... No, this is Dauze, created by Dina.org, sorry, which is an Amsterdam-based uh, think and do tank. It's an open source software um, hothouse. And uh, Dauze is an attempt to make sense of the internet of things. So in a, in a home environment where we have Alexa, where we have, you know, the... Um, the robot, uh, Hoover, and, and you name it, and more and more smart objects, uh, we are not able to control the intrusion of potential malicious actors in our network, for example, nor are we actually able to track and visualize and see really, and you know, make tangible the, um, the exchange of data that happens between our smart environment and uh, the outside. I have a, you know, in, in the good old days, before of all these tools, uh, you know, if someone breaks into your house, you notice it, right? The window is broken. You see someone with doesn't belong there and, and action is taken. How can we make sure that there is a similar alert system for the internet of things? So for, a smart, for the smart home. So th they created what is called the internet of things awareness box or this switch on off 
the on-off button for the Internet of Things. As you can see, there is a little red light. This is a prototype. It never actually reached a large-scale production, but for a variety of reasons, it was an, an activist intervention. But the idea is that you can also build it yourself through the workshops that the group organizes. And uh, what happens is that uh, if there is, so the, there is basically, you put this box in, next to your router, and the box basically alerts you with sound and flashing red light when there is an unwanted intrusion in the network or a strange data exchange that um, you should not expect. And uh, in this way, it creates awareness, right, of the, the decisions that we make when we buy, for example, Alexa or any equivalent uh, smart home uh, device. And the last one that I like to mention that is they're all described in much more details in the article is Cubes, which is, as they presented by its, its very own creator, a reasonably secure operating system. Now, no one in his right mind can actually ever, uh, ever uh, you know, um, unless mal with malicious intent, promise uh, security in the digital environment for a variety of reasons. But Cubes is uh, oriented, so it was created. So it's an operating system uh, uh, like Office or something, which you can install in your computer and allows you to create separate entities. So separate machines in one machine, where to operate, where to play out different parts of your life. I give you a very concrete example. Let's say I'm a human rights activist in an authoritarian country, but I want to protect my family from uh, you know, potential uh, repression. And you know, also want to keep this separate from my shopping, let's say, activities, right? Then cubes would allow me to create these uh, discrete machines in my own machine. They are not identity. They are literally different machines operating your own. Um, in, in one single machine. It's quite a complex process. It's quite very interesting. It's also not exactly easy to use, not very smooth as a process in terms of like, it's very difficult to actually imagine our life as discrete units. And we also assisted uh, for this paper, we, we, we had the chance to go through a number of workshops where people were really trying to adopt this software. But besides that, this is another good example of how you know, people can contribute to create imaginaries that, and the critical imagination that transforms data into data activism or data into citizen agency for the data fight society. And I want to really conclude now saying that we, as the privileged observers, have a critical role to play. What do I mean by that? I mean, uh, for a lot of us, I mean, this is the normal administration, right? I mean, we don't scare off technology because we often teach technology. We use it. We are big fans of technology. But not the same, the same, the same can be said about different age groups, but also simply people that don't have the privilege of you know, spending time thinking about technology. And that's why I think you know, we could also see ourselves as you know, those playing uh, the role of you know, diagnostics, but also storytellers, educators, which we are typically working university, translators, facilitators of, for the acquisition of data literacy skills. Which, to be very fair, I think it's in the in the in the hands of the state and state institutions, the public health, the public uh, school education, sorry, education system, to to instill and bring forward. But um, you know, in a system which is still uh, relatively behind, we also have a role uh, to play. And I guess I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much for your patience. Um, there's something before that. I actually, this is a little plug for a project that is now ended, which was part of Data Active Trajectory. It's called tracking exposed the software, but this is about tools that uh, help us to uncover and tracking, uh, the, the tracking, so micro-targeting uh, on social media and shopping platforms like Amazon or uh, YouTube or Facebook. And maybe I can tell you more later in the question time if you're curious, but that's, uh, that's also what we try to do. So developing methods that then their software, there's small pieces of software that are very easy to use that people can install in their desktop computer that then allows them to also, uh, you know, um, come to grips with, for example, a, a process like political micro-targeting. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave it at that and I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. This was great. So I, I particularly love that you started to talk with uh, an article by my 
postdoc advisor Dirk Helding, um, which I think is a sort of shadow bridge between um, all, all of what you talked about and, and, and where I'm coming from, which is really, really interesting, I think. So, so I, I thank you very much. This was super inspiring. And there's a lot of like connection points, I think. And um, I would like to sort of, um, after the, uh, as usual, silent applause. So let's thank uh, <laughs> Stefania uh, on Zoom. Um, I would like to rotate out uh, the discussion like stri straight to the group. Um, and so it's the same game as always. Um, you can put your name in the chat so I know in what sequence uh, uh, you want to speak, who, whoever goes first. And then um, um, whoever raises, you can also raise your hand um, in, the, um, in, in the Zoom thing. And so there is already two people in line. Um, so Mike Tum was first and then Mila Oiva. Mike. Can you hear me? Uh, you, With a I, bit I think, of echo? <laughs> uh, I think you should switch off the microphone and the speaker on your laptop. Maybe while you do this, maybe Mila goes first so you can solve the technical issue. Mila. All right. Um, you know, thank you. This is a beautiful, uh, amazing talk. And I have actually a lot of question, questions, but I, I try to, you know, focus now on one, one or, or two questions. Um, I think that uh, if I kind of um, read or understood your, your talk uh, correctly, it seems to me that you are suggesting as a kind of like solution to this problem or, or a, as a way to regaining the agency, uh, kind of like different forms of education and, and enlightening people on, on these matters. Um, but I was also uh, wondering, do you see also other kinds of things that we should be doing or in order to kind of like raise this issue? Is it, do we need more public discussion or is there somewhere need for, I don't know, increased control uh, or some other kind of kinds of like, kind of like things that should be done here? And uh, in connection to that, um, at the first part of your talk, it seemed, uh, seemed to me that you were mostly talking as if there is this um, dichotomy between citizens and the kind of like political leaders. Uh, but of course, as you were also mentioning in your talk, uh, there are, you know, there are companies that are playing great role in this and, and NGOs and different kinds of groupings of people, uh, political, apolitical, and, and so on. So how do you see also the role of different kinds of groups um, within the society and, and taking part in this, uh, this discussion? This is a messy, messy question. I apologize, but- uh, No, no, it's very clear. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mila, for, for this question. Yeah, I mean, I, I always play in, in, in dichotomy, but of course, reality is much more uh, complex than that. And it is also true, I mean, that I am a big fan of literacy. I did try. So in the past, I also did a little bit of work. Um, and uh, in my own country, the Ministry of Education, University and Research, trying to design this type of literacy programs. And uh, I see it as a fundamental, I mean, it's, it's really a basic starting point. I mean, take, for example, in the Netherlands, where there's a lot of water, a lot of canals, children learn to swim in school. They don't really learn to become, you know, top class swimmers. They learn to survive if they fall into the water. In the same way in, in which they learn to stop at the stop sign when they ride their bike. But not enough attention is devoted to, you know, creating the digital citizens of the present, not even the future, right? At the same time in which we give children a smartphone when they're six or something. So for me, that's, uh, you know, it's, that's a bit of an obsession. So you, you, you spot it rightly uh, there. But uh, of course, I mean, the education is only a part of the story also because it only affects a small part of, um, of the citizens. Although those that also have often the possibility of playing, you know, a bit of a flywheel role with, within also, well, with the older generation. But definitely we need much more public discussion. I was very happy to see 
a discussion in the Netherlands in Parliament about contact tracing apps, something which, for example, did not happen at all in my home country in Italy, where we are really behind when it comes to anything digital and we really buy pretty much any, I mean, even the media coverage, like the role of the media is very important, right? I mean, and for, it's not completely a random that a lot of the examples that I often use in my talks are from the UK. I mean, the UK, they, they might have a problem, but there's not a much bigger problem than any other countries, developed country. They simply have a much more attentive media sector where the Guardian, for example, is really often on the case writing about these things, uncovering uh, the issue. Uh, so we also need uh, much more public discussions, public debate about these things in which the media, you know, as a sort of watchdog, if you want, they should play a big role. But also, uh, you know, often there's no debate in parliament because the very same parliamentarian by the somewhat simplistic explanation, you know, the, the, the basically the elevator pitch of the uh, of big um, tech uh, or, and small uh, tech uh, companies. Uh, the, your hypothesis, like the, 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 the idea of increased control of the technology, I think it's a very important one, but one for which I think we're not yet entirely ready. And for which, you know, the various experiments that been, uh, I've been doing, think for example, about the cookie, the cookie banners, right? Uh, where, you know, they are designed to be an instrument of awareness, but as a matter of fact, we just click, click it away, just go, go, give me my content, right? And we are the people that actually pay attention to that because we study this stuff, imagine the others. So, um, you know, increased control is probably a bit difficult to, um, to, to plant as, an, as, as a solution at the moment. I mean, that's what we try to do with the, the software that we designed from an original idea of Claudio Agosti, um, a hacker who really wanted to you know, empower citizens to reflect on their information diet. So for example, when we create the software, the tracking exposed software for, to understand the, what content you're served on Facebook, for example, and what you are missing comparing you know, what I'm served with what your, you and other people are served. Uh, the idea was really, you know, we, we pitch it, the, the, the slogan that we use is like, do not delete Facebook, also because back then there was the delete Facebook campaign that you might remember, give your profile to science. So the idea of really creating, of changing the narrative also a bit away from uh, a hi, uh, I'm scared and I hate technology. I mean, technology is scary, run away, like go back to the caves, but more uh, towards uh, a technology. We all like technology. Let's use it, but let's use it in a much more informed manner. So um, yes, there's a lot of work to do. This is probably a multi-pronged uh, you know, approach. Uh, I still do believe that literacy is very important and literacy is not just, you know, school based literacy. Again, in the Netherlands, there's been a very nice um, public broadcast that we participated on as with my research group for children aged six to eight on teaching them what is, I mean, the notion of algorithms and their risks. And, uh, you know, we did so cooking a pancake, making a pancake, which is a typical Dutch children food, which I like a lot. And, uh, you know, like using also different, you know, metaphors and different imagery. Again, this is, this was oriented for, this was done for children, but, uh, you know, adults also need something uh, like that. So there's a, there's a role to play pretty much for anyone. And I don't know exactly what, want to give priority, what to give priority to. But there's a, yeah, definitely a lot of work to do. And something that, uh, you know, at the moment I think is only done literally by some enlightened media but, and then NGOs like, uh, for example, those behind the Reclaim Your Face campaign. Thank you very much. I hope um, this answers your question. We could discuss it for long. I, I would like to uh, ask you to um, sort of embellish or go deeper on two points you were making because you were repeating that. Like one was the situation in Italy which uh, just recently hired this, uh, um, I know, was it the CTO or one of the closest five advisors of, of Jeff Bezos in Amazon, who worked there for 15 years, who now basically does something that looks very similar to the Estonian healthcare ID system. And so when, from the outside, this looks very good, right? This looks like, oh, somebody has their act together 
and now build something that's sort of working in the in, in Estonia uh, for a country like Italy. But you said like there is uh, things that where you you know you have trust issues, and probably many other Italians have trust issues. If you look at like how data and and Italy is a country where there were data was stored in all sorts of databases, right? Like if you had a speeding ticket, there was no um, probability that you get it sent to your German address, for example. So, so today, like as this integration happens, like what would that trust issue actually be? Where do you see the actual hurdles? And number two, the other point, which I think would be uh, really cool to go into a little bit uh, deeper, is this issue of literacy and criticism, which are two points, which, and this is like a little bit of advertising in two weeks, there will be Phil Menser giving a talk um, in the same uh, time slot, um, who in one of his projects actually um, sort of concluded that criticism is not enough, right? Like in, in the US, we've bred all this criticism, <laughs> which has no substance. Um, they, they get their literacy from uh, basically Steve Bannon, and then they're very critical, and then they don't get vaccinated. So the question is like, is there what's the missing thing if you have literacy and criticism how can we like like what kind of value system do we need in addition in order to sort of like make this all happen so italy and and, and criticism yeah thank you very much maximilian these are difficult questions so <laughs> Uh, I mean, with Italy, I have a bit of a twisted relation, as you can imagine. I'm, I'm, I'm an Italian citizen and I love my country, but I also lived abroad for a long time and still observing everything from afar. But I also had the chance in the past to observe how digital policies were done. And I have a lot of anecdotes that are actually funny if, you know, if you don't think this is happen this happened for real <laughs> in your own country, right? <laughs> So, but beyond the anecdote, which, you know, when, when working in the ministry, I really saw things that you humans, you know, like really seriously, you hope never to, to see anywhere. But, um, you know, the issue of the trust issues, the, I mean, Italy is, I'm sorry to say, but it's a deeply corrupt country and a country that um, as, um, I mean, well, decisions are not taken. I mean, I'm generalizing here, right? And I'm sorry about that. I've not done research, just a direct experience and not very good. So take it with a grain of salt. But like um, countries which are a bit behind in technology adoption, now of course, smartphones have changed, um, have changed the story massively, but we are still one of the last countries for internet penetration mm -hmm. uh, amongst the 27 countries. And we are also um, the ones of the with the one with the lowest um, um, digital literacy skills. So given this situation, you can also reasonably assume that the decision makers are not exactly smart either, right? Uh, so again, I'm generalizing, but uh, so it's a relatively, I mean, it's bigger than Estonia. Uh, and uh, and it knows also as uh, the different the, there's a regional. I give you the example of healthcare. Healthcare is one of the few realms in which regions have um, uh, the, the ability to rule over essentially. So healthcare. So if I'm from Veneto, which I happen to be from the region of Venice in the north, and I want to be vaccinated in another region because that's where I'm working temporarily. It's it, it's actually hard. I mean, there's no way for these regions. I mean, pre-COVID, there was no way for the the two data sets to communicate. Okay. Um, so this was one of the problems, and then all of a sudden, you want to tell me, you know, that's what they try to tell us, that uh, you know, there's going to be this uh, this vaccine, the digital, the the, the green pass which actually is all in operation. It's a bit of a miracle. I still don't know exactly how they made it happen, but that all of a sudden is, is going to be interoperable. So bring all these data sets into the same uh, interoperable system. I mean, think that basically pub the regions can also have decision-making power also over public procurement. So it means that, you know, there's different data sets, different softwares being used, different uh, type of data that is collected in various regions, right? And all of a sudden, we created an interoperable layer that is supposed to 
bring together all these national different, uh, sorry, the regional different databases with, for example, the European and maybe the global, maybe the Chinese. Because if the, the global uh, health uh, pass has to work, I mean, sorry, the digital green pass has to work also in the international level, that, that's gonna be some, some, um, some exchange there. Now, the problem is that at the same time, so if this is, these are the technical issues that you face, you also have, uh, you know, the fact that the media are not really paying any attention to any of this. And so, for example, the news that uh, Roma, the, the football club, spent 6 million euros to implement facial recognition camera on the Roma stadium was really welcome with a couple of articles like this long, which were advertising spots. I mean, it was taken from the press release and put into the main national newspaper. No other single person raised an issue. Maybe actually, you know, that's not super, super good, right? Although we also know that the stadiums have a history of violence. So maybe that's actually good at the end of the day, whatever, right? So, sorry, I'm, I'm putting together a lot of things. The trust issue, is, it's a big problem, but it's also, you know, a trust issue, which is based on a history of um, uh, not so, solid technology projects in the past and uh, matched with uh, you know a certain level of dissatisfaction i mean like a certain awareness that there might be some corruption happening you know at some point of the of the process <laughs> with the fact that citizens themselves are uh, you know don't know much about technology essentially so don't have the instruments to to um, to, to talk about this to, 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 to make sense of this now it's very good that uh, you know they they get like the big names to the big experts to la la but it's not a problem with expertise i mean we have excellent developers in italy we have very smart people don't, don't get me wrong mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that uh, i mean that's probably part of uh, getting the big name is probably part of the attempt to uh to uh yeah, to, to, to create the trust that we're talking about right here. But I'm not sure exactly that's the best way to proceed. There's a lot of work to do, essentially. At the same time, I'm also not living there. I know from my parents that they actually do a lot of stuff online at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's good. But uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what, what the situation is right now. When it comes about the, uh, the literacy and the criticism, that's actually also a problem that like many affects many other countries. I mean, also also Italy. But, uh, you know, all this skepticism against uh, science in general and against, uh, of course, medical science as well, and in general, the system, right? But then again, I do believe that a lot of it, and it's not exclusively, I mean, fear is not necessarily based on ignorance, but it's also based on ignorance, in part. So if I do not know what I'm talking about, I might feel simply put in danger. If I do not know how a vaccine comes together and the rigorous, uh, you know, process through which science produces, you know, medical science and pharma uh, science produces, I mean, gets to uh, medical products, then I do, I may, I may raise questions like, oh yeah, but they did it in three months, is that possible, it must be crap. Mm -hmm. um, so then again, the literacy goes through, uh, you know, explaining patiently how things are. At the same time, yes, there is all mis mistrust in the system. I don't really know exactly what was the missing link and how to, you know, I don't have the magic band. Uh, but I do notice that in the report, when you see now cases of people that are hospitalized or even died from COVID, um, they, one of the, because they were not vaccinated, the first uh, one of the first reactions of the family of the survivors or the person who then eventually luckily survived from COVID is like, it's not that I am anti-vax, I'm just scared. So I think there's also a little bit of a change in discourse there in the moment mm. in which, uh, you know, certain, there's more stigma against certain types of uh, behavior, but there's a lot of work to do. And I'm really not sure if this answer your question is probably my tooth here speaking. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> But no, 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 no. This is. Uh, I think this these is, are things for for drinks. We have to talk about no, this no, over drinks. What, one one last point before I, I hand it over to other people. Um, you said Italy is behind. Uh, I always I, I lived in Italy for over three years, and then I, I moved to Texas. I always have the feeling Italy is ahead of many places. You know, you had Berlusconi ten years before the U.S. had Donald Trump. <laughs> Uh, the, the democratic parties on the left and right split into tiny fragments 10 years before anywhere else. And so I, I, my last book I read in this direction was this Andresando del Lago 
Populismo Digitale, which um, unfortunately mm -hmm. I don't know even know if there is an English version, but it's sort of, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about, like, yes, on the one hand, it's a country that's behind, but on the other hand, there is, there is a lot of stuff that's really advanced, uh, including the people who learned how to cope with the situation. So in some sense, the solution may also come out of Italy, which is a quite interesting thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, that's an interesting proposition. Uh, I like to think of my country as a regime country. Um, I mean, like in a variety of ways, right? I also like to think that countries with, uh, with this history of uh, disasters and corruptions typically also learn to survive in the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. So I always say, you know, like it's, it's a bit of a stupid, uh, stupid analogy, but if you take a Dutch citizen and there's a famine and there's no food for, you know, they're going to die in three days, but the Italians are probably going to survive because they're going to, you know, they to do something. And, and it's nothing against the Dutch or in favor of the Italians. It's just, you know, a bit of a comparison when, you know, you realize that with little resources, a lot of things are done in, in, in Italy. That's absolutely true. When it comes to Berlusconi, that's, that's I mean, I, 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 I hear that. And also with the five-star movement and all of that, we did actually curiously pave the way for a number of, of phenomena, which then, you know, being Italy, luckily a small country, don't have the resonance that, you know, the consequences of, of Trump administration, right? Because we simply don't have enough leverage in the world, luckily. But uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, this is always hope, right? And I'm not the one uh, to say it's not the case. Uh, maybe the solution is going to come from there. I mean, like, amongst the, the, the best the blockchain developers that are Italians, by the way. Mm -hmm. So let, let's see what, what comes out of, of that. It's Big just rush. that, yeah, that the state is a bit of a, of a difficult machine there, but yeah. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I think I hope now it's what? No? Why? Just a moment. Ah. Ah, it works now. It works now. Okay, perfect. Because the two microphones and then to, to arrange it in a proper way, it, it takes some effort. Uh, okay, first of all, I wanted to, um, before asking questions, I wanted to make one comment, which is more or less actually partly related to, to what you have been talking with Max about for, for, for the last five minutes, namely about the, the, the country to country comparison. Uh, case number one, uh, in Russia nowadays, uh, they very actively use the facial recognition software uh, to identify people who go to the anti-government rallies and protests. Uh, and on order of well, several hundreds people at least have been just simply rounded on the streets or in the metro by basically uh, <clears throat> they show them footage of them somewhere during the, the supposedly illegal protest. And then people are happy, happy to get away with a fine and then some of them go to, to jail for that. Uh, even more uh, importantly, uh, probably, although it is, I'm less personally familiar with that, is what is going on in China with respect to, 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 to this sort of software, and then especially in Xinjiang region, where uh, people are basically um, put it in a sort of um, uh, totalitarian supervision by uh, means of uh, this sort of uh, software. Uh, so actually, I, I, I think it is, it is I, I think it is quite understandable that everybody is more or less uh, thinking first and foremost about the place where they, they are, we are living. But it is very important to understand that, that it is a much even more serious problem and much more serious problem in, in case when this sort of software gets uh, uh, in the hands of uh, totalitarian regimes. And uh, this scandal with this, uh, this Israeli software, which was happening several months ago, when, when 
turned out that they sold it to, to, to various ugly regimes all over the world is uh, a very serious problem. Uh, that was a comment. Uh, and now uh, concerning a uh, question. Uh, actually, uh, I would, in my mind, I structured what you are saying basically in terms of, not in terms of, of identifying problem, but in terms of suggesting solutions. Uh, that one thing is very, uh, very niche, but, but all, very nice, but very niche, this sort of uh, various guerrilla ways of uh, uh, protecting oneself from, 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 uh, from uh, data collection, supervision, etc. Another one is education. What I would like to understand, is there a role for um, legislation for uh, for direct political uh, uh, direct political um, inter interference in, in this field and, and what sort of interference if you, if you think is, is, could be useful? That is one question. Uh, another question uh, uh, is more or less as follows. As we see now, there is a rising awareness uh, of this problem in various segments of society, which are generally speaking not very friendly towards each other otherwise. For example, there is a very uh, strong, uh, well, frankly, well, the, the, the sort of discourse and the sort of uh, Set of explanations you offered. It was it was very distinctly left wing in, in what what you have been speaking. But at the same time, we know that there are uh, pockets of uh, populist right which are very aware of of supervision, very aware of 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 uh, this uh, as what they call censorship from the media, from from the from the platforms, etc. And my question is, do you think there is any uh, space for communication and collaboration between these very distant, politically distinct sides uh, in terms of a, a sort of a common interest and commonly identified problem in this sense? Uh, okay. Can, and I can, think I will stop there. Well, well, I have sort of uh, my third question, but, but it yeah. will take too, too much time to formulate. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mike. Yeah, of course, I mean, like I, I focus deliberately on, on liberal democracy in the West for its ambition. I mean, like I'm looking, for example, now at Europe because Europe has had uh, over the, the years um, an ambition to intervene in terms of, uh, you know, in, in the normative uh, development what, for what concerns technology. Think, for example, about the general data protection um, regulation. So, which is not very, not that great, but still, you know, the best we might have, we may argue, I mean, or still consider a sort of new uh, gold uh, standard. The law is, is to some extent already old uh, today, uh, three years after it was uh, implemented. But um, so, you know, in, in a moment in which you have, or in an organization set or institutions in which you have uh, this, this normative ambition is also good to know whether, uh, you know, then these are, this is also a place for, for more ambitious than type of uh, moves. Like for example, I'm looking with increasing interesting uh, interest about the facial recognition part, uh, that, I mean, uh, technology and the implementation of all that at the European level. Now, but of course, uh, countries like uh, Russia and China have been leading, and not only those, but a number of authoritarian countries uh, have been leading when um, it, it concerns uh, the implementation of intrusive uh, technology for social control. Another example I use all the time, we talk about uh, Russia, the anti-system um, protesters being uh, identified through that, that, that uh, manner, but also, for example, think about Hong Kong, China in a way, uh, where, uh, you know, do you might remember the protesters a few years ago, the, the pro-democracy protests 
where they were taking down even physically the, the smart lampposts that were supposed to, to harbor to house also facial recognition technology. So yes, it is happening uh, across the spectrum uh, in a way. And I do believe that the pandemic has just contributed to accelerate this uh, process. Now, uh, when it comes for space, uh, the rule for the role for legislation, legislation in this process is key, but it's also very, very difficult to implement for a variety of reasons, not only the lobbying. Uh, for example, the GDPR was the one, I don't remember now the numbers off the top of my head, but it was the biggest. So you saw the biggest involvement of lobbyists that came directly from the Silicon Valley. And they were in Brussels lobbying. E, uh, um, European Member of Parliament for years in a row in the you know run up to the the, the adoption of the legislation. So um, le legislation is difficult for a reason because there's a lot of I mean you're we are touching we would touch on very um, valuable assets for society right and for certain uh, companies which are you know the leading companies today those that trade information and make sense of information but also it's difficult because it's difficult to follow up i mean typically legislation is trying to catch up with technological development rather than uh, I'm the sorry, uh, may interrupt a little bit. Sure, please. Uh, i understand that, 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 that what, what you are saying is very important indeed uh, what I want to understand is, do you have any recites uh, for, for the legislation? Do you, do you have any idea what would be the ideal legislation, even given that, uh, that it is very difficult to achieve? No, I don't actually. So I, have, I can point you to certain people that I think are working on that, uh, mm -hmm. which are very valuable. One of them is the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, where I used to work in the past. Mm -hmm. The Citizen Lab is, um, is mostly trying to uh, to uh, intervene in the realm of, uh, for example, interference and information controls. So not general identification and AI, but more like when technology is used, like um, intrusive technology is, uh, for example, sold. And, and mm -hmm. we're talking about weapons here, right? To um, authoritarian countries who then use it against human rights defenders, for example. So the Citizen Lab is being very active on that for what concerns inform, uh, sen internet censorship and what they call information controls. There's many colleagues here in Amsterdam, for example, from EVIR, which is the Institute for Information Law, that are, you know, looking at, uh, so they're lawyers, so much more uh, qualified than I might be <laughs> to talk about the legislation, and they're really, there's also an observatory on the new uh, Digital Services Act and the other one that now, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling very well and I'm a bit drugged with uh, painkillers. The other big actor that the European Union is working on. So they are keeping really an eye and also making very concrete policy uh, proposals. Um, actually, you know, if you look at more of the interdisciplinary conversation where there might be hints at it, or what you're talking about, but not necessarily very concrete solutions, but part of the discussion. Um, a couple of weeks ago, together with some colleagues, we released a special issue of the Internet Policy Review, which is called, entitled, Governing, um, no, wait, go, <laughs> I don't remember now the title of the, the special issue that I contributed to write, that's great. <laughs> but it's anyway on governing European values inside data flows, something like that. So the idea is that, for example, the European Union or the European Union level, there's a lot of talk about European values, but hardly any specification on what is meant with that. And there's, um, there's quite some, um, for example, there's an article there by Lina Dancic and a colleague that look at how, um, what is meant by, so they, they did a content analysis of the multi-stakeholder consultation on the white paper on AI. And then so what is meant by rights and what is left out. So there's, there's a lot of food for thought there. So, but I don't have as um, the, 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 the perfect recipe myself, but there's luckily a lot of colleagues who are working on that. And now your second question about the space for collaboration within, you know, let's say groups that are positioned in, in diametrically opposed sides of the political spectrum, I have to say, I find it very, very difficult having studied and, um, hanged out with uh, activists, um, mostly from the radical left and radical developers for, for decades now, uh, there is a certain um, distrust 
uh, and the unwillingness to collaborate with the fascist, for example, right? So I'm, I'm cutting a long story short here. Of course, uh, not everyone ascribes to the words fascist or anything, but what we see is that there is really a, a major gulf um, so that uh, I don't, I'm not very positive about a potential collaborations uh, because the value system is, is really miles apart. Although the promise might be that people face a very similar without the maybe. So I hope this answers your question. It's a bit, I'm quite negative about that. That's that is uh, that's a, that is an opinion you share with many people, right? And uh, it's quite interesting when you look at similar discussions around 2012, where the idea was that, oh, we need to prevent certain things from happening that we have seen unfold in the US, for example. And in 2016, then we saw that the shit will hit the fan. And now the key question is, how do you come up, like, if you want to be very cynical, how do you come up with the constitutional sentence that we need to put in a future constitution once we are over it? And so that is, I think, this recipe question is indeed a very, very good one, right? Like the first you know, paragraph in the German base law, the dignity of humans is inviolable. Um, th there is no, we have no answer for data so far. And, and, and GDPR is heavily influenced by lobbyists. So this is something where we all need to work together. And I think we all have sort of um, our, our things to contribute. And, what I, what I heard throughout all of your talk, which I think is it, there, there's many, many, my, you may not have a recipe, but there's a lot of really interesting sort of building blocks towards such recipes. And I think that is some uh, sort of something which I would like to message to, my, to the group here. Like part of what you said is, is actually feeding into the purpose of Kudan, right? This, this whole idea, the cultural data analytics, um, is something that can be also for the social good. Data science, machine learning for the social good does exist as topics. And uh, of course, there is always dual use. Um, people can misuse it. Even what we find out, that's another whole question. Like how do we do things and, not make, and make sure that they will not be used against us, for example, right? Like when we do, we learn something about um, you know, pictures on social media, and then people immediately use it sort of like to actually sort of like extract more from society. And I think that is sort of something which, which, which is, is really very important thing that the feedback loop necessitates also data analytics, which is, I think, something uh, really, really, really important. We cannot solve the, uh, the, the world and the conundrum with more humanities sort of rejecting analysis and quantification because it's the world is simply not a world of averages i think that is sort of something important uh, and, and there you gave a lot of good pointers so so i think your your answer that you don't have a recipe is, is sort of half wrong because you actually have a lot of like ingredients for a recipe and so we're still cooking i guess um so i, I thank you very much for this mark metz has the next question May I react on the, on the, on the uh, Can we like like I would like to give time to like uh, like a broader variety of people, but but yes, you, you, please put in a chat. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, so so sorry, I think I missed a bit from the previous discussion. So I hope I'm not repeating. But thank thank you for the clear presentation, really, and uh, interesting one. And, but but. Uh, so, so firstly, like really simple question: Would you put any like any of these aspects uh, forefront? So it's like, you know, there's a, a danger to the sort of our agency, and in, in one part, it's it might be because of and, and the democracy, and the one part is because of uh, uh, conscious misuse of AI, and the other part is like uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, non-deliberate um, backlash of. Uh, Kind of uh, biased AI, etc. But we to put uh, either of these problems uh, in front that we, this one should be dealt first. Or well, the just to summarize, the non-deliberate bias, and the other is. Uh, so, so the other other one would be that uh, let's say some uh, uh, political power just uh, uses the AI data, etc., for some uh, non-democratic purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the, is either of these problems like bigger, would you say, or like more burning? That the, the mis, misuse, conscious misusing of AI, but the fact that the AI technologies, they're 
uh, just biased. We don't know about it, and therefore it uh, slowly eats away the democracy. Stefania, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. I'm losing my, my, <laughs> my ability to control the microphone. Um, no, so I would say, so uh, what I, I said is th thank you, uh, Mark, for the challenging questions. Very interesting. I never thought about it before, but with my obsession for infrastructure and for things that are invisible, I would say the, the bias in AI, so the invisible part in a way, it's uh, what worries me the most because me is used. I mean, sooner or later, I like to think that it comes to light. Think about Cambridge Analytica. Maybe it came to light a bit late, and uh, but uh, it did trigger some broader reflection on society. So in a way or another, I think it's easier to detect or to keep an eye on than unconscious bias in uh, technology or simply technology being rolled out without much uh, thinking. Um, and uh, it's also probably a much difficult uh, solution uh, how do we, I mean, whereas, for example, we do have uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, if you're a medical doctor or if you are whatever journalist, in principle, you have to abide to some ethical principles, not the same can be said about AI developers, for example, uh, for good reasons, maybe, uh, but um, it's, a, it's a much more gray area than uh, you know misuse by uh, political actors i think society in a way in a nutshell has less instrument to detect that and less antibodies if you want to go with the pandemic you know language to detect and solve um, the bias in technology than it has to detect and address in a way or another uh, misuse of political uh, power but that's maybe i would be curious to know what you think uh, this this uh, it's a good reasoning actually yeah I, I I could totally go with that actually because I I would agree yeah, that that society is less prepared especially for for this aspect actually but if I may I, I would follow a different uh, question I was also wondering well partly about um, but how about the positive part of AI <laughs> but uh, in in the sense that uh, so. I mean, theoretically, so, so there's, you know, uh, trying to use AI to actually, so I mean, AI in some sense, it's used to make the life easier, but it's also used to fight corruption, right? So if it's used in like decision making, um, and like, so who should we give the money to? Who should we, uh, uh, who's, who should we send to prison? Who are the risk groups, etc.? Like the example uh, uh, you brought also that. But it turns out that, okay, you want to use the AI for good, but it turns out to be biased. But uh, do you have, do you know any like kind of different examples that, uh, that the ones that are not often talked about that AI might actually work in the benefit of uh, democracy somehow? Maybe even a meta level, AI being, uh, uh, taking look of other, uh, being aware of other AIs <laughs> or et cetera. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, like um, a lot of us, I mean, I use AI, my, I mean, it's part of my, my regular life, right? I use biometric to access my, my backbook air. I use it to, you know, I love when I'm skiing, you know, I haven't done that in a while with the pandemic, but, and I cannot, I don't have to take off my, my gloves and it's cold to, you know, to access my phone because it just, it just goes to, to look for my big nose and then, hey, all of a sudden I can answer the, 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 the you know, I can attend to my phone. So, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I, um, it's, it's uh, you know, AI is part of our life. It's, going, it's there to stay and it's also pretty cool in many respects. Now, um, the only case that, I, that just comes to mind now with my, you know, dumb brain uh, of, of someone with, with two take is um, Susie AI, uh, which is that uh, Susie written as uh, Susie, like the, um, like the female name. Unfortunately, I mean, that's, I, I find it very disturbing. Like Alexa is a female name. You know, it's like, you know, the, the secretary is called female, right? So I, I already told the, the developers, I mean, from several years ago that I really didn't like uh, 
their choice of, of name. Maybe, you know, you can call it Alex, which is, you know, can be male or female and we're all happy or something like that. But Susie.ai, if you look it up, is an example of a sort of democratic, I mean, democratic maybe is a big word, but like a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a sort of home assistance system, like similar to Alexa, but developed by activists. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're open source developers. They do it for money. I mean, they're not, so they're maybe, you know, not the, like the quintessential activists, but I actually met them in the context of, uh, you know, progressive developers uh, meetings and stuff like that. And the idea is, is to, uh, you know, uh, have an AI system that still supports you, but that doesn't send the, the, the data directly to, to Amazon, for example. Uh, so there are many examples of how, uh, you know, technology that's being developed uh, with different, um, different um, value systems. Uh, now, of course, uh, does it have the same power to scale up to society as Alexa has? I doubt it simply because, you know, that they don't have the same resources. It's not the same beautifully packaged product that works seamlessly. So it requires, again, a bit of, um, of patience from the users and education and willingness to be, to, to, to be different in a way. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there's, so I, I have no example now about fighting corruption, but I have an other example of positive um, impact of AI or positive use of AI. You might know a project which is Syrian German, uh, which is called the Syrian Archive. And the Syrian Archive, has, uh, so there are a bunch of developers and human rights activists who are trying to collect, so to create an enormous database, data set really of, um, um, all violence, so all in the sense of violence perpetrated by all sides of the Syrian conflict. And the idea is that there's a lot of evidence of this, um, of this violence, which, you know, happens to, I mean, is, is uh, you know, uh, comes through people's phones, goes, is shared on Twitter, is shared on Facebook or whatever, but then, you know, disappears into thin air because it's difficult to retrieve. So uh, in, the, in the idea that one day there might be, I don't know, it'd be like, uh, you know, the, a court in The Hague, uh, like for, for the former Yugoslavia or whatever, then these people mm, set on uh, trying to systematize this and verify this information, verify the information as well, which is not uh, super easy. And they're also experimenting with AI um, ways, supported ways of doing that. You can imagine also that this is, uh, well, it's a very, uh, granular type of work, but also one that has quite some, uh, how you say, um, em emotional costs. Like imagine spending days and days of your life in a row as your main occupation, identifying and verifying information of violence in a war scene. It's not exactly fun. And, and so they're trying to experiment, develop themselves ways, AI informed ways of doing it. This is an, an example that comes to mind, but there's definitely, I'm sure, many others. Mm -hmm. where, I mean, the same way in which there is uh, data activism tries to use data to fight corruption. And, uh, you know, just to use your example, there's, uh, there's certainly also people that, that, that do AI stuff. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's an interesting example. I didn't know. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so we have six more minutes left and there's one hand still raised, um, which is Mark Hanet, um, who joins us from Hong Kong. Hello, uh, thank you for this interesting and enlightening talk. Uh, I have some, some things that I want to share. Well, first is that you were talking about this, uh, the quality of software. Well, I have the, I think I have an opinion why the software is crap in most of the countries. This is this system of the procurements and the cheapest option. Uh, this is definitely, is architecturally the problem of the software in most of the countries by far. Uh, they do. They do normally uh, in Spain. The, in, in in Spanish, it's called las carnitas, basically the meat, the, the meters or, or the meat factory, because they actually the the consulting companies they get all these contracts and they put uh, basically they sell cheap architects, but they put uh, basically internship people there. It means the quality of the code is crap. They managed to put there, and then it's like our radar that was developed by Indra, and and it was um, first put in the Algeria uh, war. That when it was on, didn't track anything, and 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 like this, all works like that. And um, but then coming back to Estonia, 
Well, actually, what is missing in many countries is actually some kind of ship data architect or ship software. The, in Estonia, what is good is that they have this. Um, Otber uh, Belsberg uh, works in the government of Estonia. Did a, did a talk the other day that I, I listened in the in the library of Estonia, and actually show me one thing that I was really aware that it is wrong. I asked a question, didn't ask, didn't answer. And, and then actually, I actually look at later on and I found that Estonia, it will be charged with a fine of with the clear cuts in the forest, um, 100,000 per day soon together with Poland. I can share here the link. And the, the, the one who decides these cuts is an AI system, which I know because they cut using near at my home uh, a year ago. Uh, and we actually investigated, and then we found that, yeah, AI system decides the clear cuts. But if anyone doesn't know what clear cut means, it's actually a clean cut, completely cut the forest. And the, and the problem is that they have this rhetoric in the media that the forest needs to be reused, that the old forest needs to be cut, that it will grow again, and, and that the, it will uh, kind of grow um, with more strength or something like that, which I think is, is not true. And actually, for example, in the law of the clear cut, they have to leave one tree every 100 meters. And uh, I guess you what, there's no tree in 100 meters because the law doesn't say if the, the tree needs to be up or down, it means they leave, they left every 100 meters one down tree. Um, okay, means there is actually more, dangerous things also that is decided by AI than, than the face recognition. I mean, we are now facing a, a global warming um, problem also, uh, and an emergency crisis on the ecological sense. Uh, means Estonia has a lot of forest, should, should be a high priority that is not cut. Uh, the problem is that the EU is actually incentivizing these cuts by actually uh, uh, paying money to um, make this, this, this uh, wood into pillars because pillars is considered uh, a green energy. Um, and Estonia, they have like an, an emergency, uh, like they have two big companies of pillars that they're cutting non-stop, buying all the forest they can. Uh, and then the AI system is approving everything, approving everything. Um, you can check the, the, the things that I do means, yeah, it's true, there is no enough supervision. And, and actually, this is before the AI. Uh, the ones who say that this of the AI, they're actually not, not aware about the case of the UK of the post office. The post office, the software called Horizon, uh, it ended up charging 736 officers, normally the finance guy in the office, by actually, uh, uh, they were mismatching the numbers of the incomes uh, in the days, and some they end up in jail, and few even they suicide. And and this happened between 2000 and 2014. And this this software is not an AI software, but it actually was in the privatization uh, years of the UK, where actually the 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 post office became private. Then they put this software, and then. Um, there was no proper assess, and yes, there is no literacy on 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 software, and this also is in the justice system. In the justice system, there are very bad people that they don't know what the, the software they assess the software and to analyze them, so forensic of software. Th thank you very much, Mark. And, uh, and wait, the one one just the question I wanted to make is actually you mentioned this art project that is actually 10, 11 years old, the face recognition one by Adam Hardy. Of course, it doesn't work because this was uh, meant to work for the Harkas uh, case, and now it's a deep, deep AI. This is AI now has uh, like moved like a century in the AI. Uh, every year comes like a decade. Um, but anyway, uh, what my question was like, which role do you think that the artist should actually have in this uh, activism and, and the technical? Because I'm an artist. Actually. Okay, let me. And, let me... and I did art, art, art artist. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mar. Uh, Stefania, before you answer, uh, we have uh, five minutes um, because we started five minutes late. Um, so 
the first question of Mar is tied again to your uh, quote of Kennedy, not all is lost, uh, where I noted down uh, the decoupling of responsibility, which is ubiquitous in US corporations since 150 years, uh, which is also a hallmark of deniability, which is a hallmark of fascism. So this question of like, how is AI used to decouple responsibility of individuals who actually put the AI in place? You probably have something to say about that. And so if you could actually answer both of these questions, including then also the artist question, that would be awesome. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm present, but I'm PhD student in Sudan. I didn't get the last sentence, Mark. Sorry about that. You know, I, I am PhD, PhD student in Sudan. Uh. <laughs> no, thank you very much for, for your question, uh, Mark, for, for, the, for the examples. I actually didn't know about that. I'm going to look at this, this clear cut business because I'm very curious about. Uh, I mean, something I didn't talk about today, but uh, the, of course, the, the environmental costs of all of this, which is one of the big, big. Uh, you know, elephants in the room when we talk about technology, because uh, data farms and, and data society have a huge environmental footprint, and no one is ever talking about that. And there was even one mentioned, one footnote in the European Union white paper on AI about the environmental costs of all of this, right? Typically, it's presented as a, as a solution to. And this, what you presented as a case is, is actually another, you know, examples of how actually not only there is an environmental cost of AI technology or data technology in general, but it can also be used to actively undermine our environment. So that, thank you for that. Uh, the role of art, well, art has a big, big role to play. The, um, the example I use is indeed, so the original example is 11 years uh, old, but then it was picked up again in 2019, 2020 by uh, a newer group that in, got inspired by that original example. But yeah, again, I mean, as I said, it is, uh, it was, I mean, we picked it because it is a great example of how you can change the imaginary of people. I mean, instead of telling people, hey, don't ride the Moscow Metro because it is news from recent, recent I mean, from a couple of weeks ago, something that in the Moscow Metro, there is special recognition implemented, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you know, uh, instead of telling people don't do that, it's like, well, uh, think about it, be at least aware of that and that's you know extremely important and awareness should go through this effort of translation which cannot come only from academics or observers not only from the media but also from uh, people artists i mean that have a different way of engaging with reality which is also much more able to uh, appeal to the emotional side of people so actually has much more chances to succeed I would say that any you know literacy program per se, which might be tedious and boring. So definitely art has a huge role uh, to play and I would like to see more and more of that. Actually in the Netherlands is quite a lot. Um, and uh, to conclude on the decoupling of responsibility, that's something for which, I mean, I actually uh, you know point to the work of uh, Lina Danzig and, and the people at the Data Justice Lab in, uh, in uh, Cardiff, because they're doing a lot of work on that. I, um, it is indeed, I mean, the, the decoupling of responsibility is exactly the, the problem that I was pointing at with uh, the example of the child uh, subsidies in the Netherlands, right? So the fact that if it is the software's fault, it's, it's no one's fault. Luckily, there was, I mean, I was totally, you know, surprised that the government would even resign on an issue left like that. It's actually very powerful. I mean, they resigned because they knew there were elections in a way coming up in a month. So they had nothing to lose, really. They're still back in power, in fact. But, uh, so it's a bit more complex story, not as positive as we would um, like to imagine or as positive as it might seem, but, uh, seem, but definitely, uh, you know, that's something that we also should, uh, you know, be alert of, in terms of advocates and citizens in general. Because I mean, what you said about uh, Maximilian about the deniability and then you know the fascism is like, might sound like a very quick, uh, you know, uh, flow in a way, like step by step. But um, I, I, I believe that uh, we are in that, you know, going down that road, unfortunately. So. It is, um, there's, there's a lot of work to do also as, as, um, as scholars to, to, to bring society, bring awareness to society in, in uh, that level. I hope this answers your question. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit losing my, my ability to think clearly. Uh, Sorry, I asked one question that is, is 
they ask here about the clear cutting, the AI decides if it's cut or not allowed to cut. That's mm -hmm. what they do. Thank, thank you very much. So yeah, thank you, uh, Stefania. This was great. Uh, so um, and also like uh, you know we're we're all very impressed that you held up against the tooth. <laughs> yeah, I have to see the dentist tomorrow. So <laughs> okay, I'm so, just holding together before before the the solution. So. so uh, I don't know, it's like funny. Luca Torres had this like uh, suffering of bodily sufferings while being the Sun King. <laughs> so, so the key thing is like uh, great power has to come with suffering. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so I would like to thank you very much. This was a very, very, very interesting and inspiring discussion and we would love to get back to you once you're back in power and you, you won against the toothache. Um, so this was great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and I hope you are going to meet in person eventually because yes, we always yes. that. We, we we will we, we are planning a uh, there will be a big final um, Kudan conference in fall of 2023. So that's mm -hmm. the latest, and of course you're welcome to come earlier. Of course, next week, by the uh, way, um, we will have uh, a guest from the University of Michigan, which will be Elizabeth Bruch. And uh, she will speak about how cities shape uh, how cities shape our romantic lives. Wow, that's yeah. very interesting. I hope to be able to join. <laughs> bye bye. Goodbye. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>